preliminary hearing was to establish that Osmond, Bossier, and Livesey were one, associated with the newspaper, and two, they wanted to discover the volumes of which it was distributed. They called eight witnesses to the stand, many who were actually personal friends of the men. But what was interesting was, even the aide to the chief of police and the secretary of the city council, who claimed to know Bossier for 10 to 12 years, and who he'd asked them for their subscription to the newspaper, had no idea that he was associated with the mascot. Neither did any of the other men that they called up. They all acknowledged him, they knew who he was, they were good friends, but we don't know if he works for the newspaper or not. <laughs> the most interesting deposition was Kurtz, George Kurtz, who was the illustrator, whose name appeared on all the illustrations and all the, uh, the original masthead. When they asked him if he had done work for the mascot, he said, I have not that I know of. <laughs> when he asked if they first, he claimed to personally know the men of the mascot, but did not know if they actually worked for that paper. When asked again if he had done work, he said, I have done work for a paper that came out. <laughs> when the prosecutor <laughs> had called up the newspaper in front of him and asked if this was his drawing, he refused to answer. Shortly after that, in fact, the next issue, his uh, drawing and the masthead never appeared, as well as the advertisements, and never appeared in the newspaper again. The court decided that there was enough evidence for the men of the mascot to go to trial for contempt. So the trial was set for May 4th on the newspapers. It was huge and it was a very packed house because, for one reason, the former Governor Nichols was their lawyer and defending them. And I don't know if you all knew this, I just discovered this myself, that Nichols also had one arm and one leg that he had lost in the war. And his old campaign used to be, vote for what's left of Governor Nichols. <laughs> 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 so he was a huge, huge celebrity, and the courtroom was packed to the gills. And he had argued that the um, judge might have overstepped his bounds in prohibiting the mascot in advance to express and publish their own opinion. Van B's attorney stated that, the only way to preserve the liberty of the press was to destroy its licentiousness. Yeah. Um, Nichols continues to argue against the outrageous acts of Judge Ryder. And if he believed that the court had no right to issue the injunction, then they, the mascot men, had no right, had perfect right to disobey it. So seeing that the outcome wasn't necessarily in his favor, Nichols asked for a trial by jury, and he was denied. He then asked to hold it to go to the Supreme Court. He was denied. He asked if it could be suspended. It was denied. So when they called for his final testimony, Nichols, who was known as one of the kind of big verbal brawlers, stood up and said that since he didn't recognize the court's jurisdiction in this matter, that they had no testimony to offer. The men in the mascot were found guilty and they were led away to jail. The second floor of the prison in the Wesley um, contained hospital rooms, and at that time, if you could afford to pay for your meals, um, which, which is what they did, so they had many visitors coming in and out, and the newspaper said they had all the comforts of life except for liberty. Even women of the New Orleans Distinguished Society bought them flowers for um, valiantly standing up to the freedom of the press. The next issue that came out, as you can tell, it's a little rough and sketched because George Kurtz is no longer doing it. It shows how uh, the mascot is attacked by a crowd of ravenous wolves, and all the wolves have labels like Shakespeare and Fitzpatrick and the different judges. Um, once again, um, Nichols immediately filed uh, with the Supreme Court, and on May 8th, once again, in a packed courtroom, he stood up and entered his plea. I am fighting my fight and your fight, and not the fight of the editors of this newspaper. I say that under our free American institutions, the freedom of speech and the liberty of press have been absolutely, utterly, and completely removed from all constraint under the part of any one of the three departments of our government, either executive or legislative or judicial. And I am here to say and maintain that any court which has issued an injunction like this under the belief that it is justified in issuing that order to prevent the possibility of libel, has done a greater wrong than the men who would indeed have been guilty of committing libel itself. After hearing both sides, the Supreme Court declared that the injunction was in violation of the Bill of Rights in the state constitution. They also declared that no modern court in England or the United States had ever issued an injunction against a newspaper saying that they were not allowed 
to uh, publish something before. The men were released early from jail. The New York Times even mentioned how the judges had criticized the uh, former lowercase judges for their inferior knowledge of the law, but uh, credited their zeal in trying to achieve it. So of course, the, main, the next issue, shows their freedom of the liberty of the press, Van V's holiness, the Judge Monroe's jumping out of the clown, and then our mayor is running away in fear. <laughs> um, out of everybody that they spoke for in the mascot on that issue, the person that they saved their most contempt for was for Judge Ryder, who had originally issued the injunction against them. Judge Ryder is a good many things, which he ought not to be but he is nothing so much as he is an anachronism. He is as much out of place in this free land and enlightened age as Nero would have been in Syria during the age of the peaceful patriarch. He belongs to the rude times of the brutal and intemperate Jeffreys, where tyrants made sport of men's rights and liberties. And when the qualifications for judicial place consisted in the servile ferocity and unscrupulous necessity uh, to indulge the tyrant's cruel appetite, a man with despotic instincts, with his insensibility to justice and his contempt for decency, he is cramped in this free land where human rights are recognized and public opinion actually has a foothold. A dozen besotted tyrants in Asia are yearning for him right now. He should have been born 10 centuries ago, but having blundered into this unsympathetic age, he should do us all a service and move to some land where time has stood still since AD 882, <laughs> and in the midst of whose cruelty, ignorance, and squalor, he can find a fitting sphere. 